Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning, morning service at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Laguna Beach. My, My name is Don Wes Jr. and I'm going to be serving as your worship associate this morning. We're glad that so many of us joined you this morning for worship. And I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts on our topic today, which is Waiting for Superman. Our, our gathering music was the song Golden. And I was sharing, and I was sharing with Pam, and I'll share it with you guys too, is this is a song that I listen to every morning as part of my morning playlist. Mm -hmm. And it was recommended to me. I, I was staying with a friend in LA not long before I met you guys. And uh, she heard that I was listening to music every morning, and she said, is Golden on your morning playlist? And I said, no, I don't know what that song is. And she told me what the song was, and I found it. And one of the cool things about our gathering music is it's an ex a chance to exchange music. So hopefully you guys enjoy Golden. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It was uh, a part of Jill Scott's third album, which is probably why I didn't know it, because I don't have any of her albums, and let alone that I know that she had three. Um, yeah, but it was her first single, and it was released in 2004. And I did something interesting, and I, th I thought I'd share this with you, too. I've been um, messing around with artificial intelligence, and I asked uh, Microsoft's Bing AI, what would it tell you guys about the song Golden and Jill Scott? So I'm going to tell you what it said. It said, released in 2004, this track is a delightful blend of soul, R&B, and positivity. Jill Scott, hailing from Philadelphia, is not just a singer. She's a storyteller, a poet, and an advocate for self-love. Her voice wraps around your heart like a warm embrace, and her words resonate deeply. Whether you're a seasoned fan or a newcomer, Jill's authenticity and raw talent will leave you indelibly marked. Golden, picture a sun-kissed morning, the world bathed in a golden glow. That's the essence of golden. It's a celebration of life, love, and the simple joys that make our hearts dance. Jill's voice glides effortlessly over the melody, inviting us to embrace our own radiance. The rhythm is infectious, and you'll find yourself swaying along, feeling lighter with each beat. And that's the way that I felt. I hopefully that's the way that you felt. And I invite you, if you don't have a morning playlist, one of my personal routines is I use music to set my mood. And usually in the morning and sometimes during the day, I need a little reset, and I always have Jill Scott and Golden in the playlist. So again, welcome to everyone, and I want to do a land acknowledgement for the land that we are standing on. The land on which we join together in worship is the ancestral territory. Hey, I'm strumming my own freedom, playing the God in me, representing be give thanks and our reverent appreciation to the First Nations as we hold space for those who were lost and those still with us and articulate our commitment to becoming more knowledgeable and engage neighbors and allies to the First Nations. Each Sunday, anywhere there is a service held, a chalice is lit, a Unitarian Universalist service, a chalice is lit. The flaming chalice is a symbol of our faith. If you joined us at home and have a candle available, I invite you to light it so that you can join us in this practice. Here, I will light the chalice and then share a few words. We ignite our chalice today filled with the spirit of hope, hopeful for our past as spiritual seekers. Thankful for gathering again in this welcoming and loving community, connect, connecting and combining to create a unique frequency, a special imprint in this moment in time, in this moment now. We ignite this chalice in a spirit of hope, gratitude, and thankfulness for one another, for our relationships, for all that we have. We are all one in its light. We are the church of the open mind, the loving heart, and the helping hand. At UUFLB, we are a welcoming congregation with a commitment to work together to actively dismantle systemic racism and oppression in all its forms. Unitarian Universalists subscribe to no single creed, 
but have gathered a set of principles that guide us as we build a religious community together. The seven principles that Unitarian Universalist congregations affirm and promote will be on the screen shortly, and they're also on the back of your order of service. And as a short reminder, today we're having a special congregational meeting, and we're going to be having it for a single purpose, and that is to adopt uh, all eight of the Unitarian Universalist principles, the seven that we're all familiar with here, and the eighth principle, which has been circulating for the past few years. Whoever you are, whomever you love, no matter your age or gender, your ancestral or ethnic background, and whatever sincere questions that, bring with, that you bring with you today, whatever has brought you here this morning, we welcome you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as spiritual and ethical beings. A community which supports each of us as we work to make a difference in the world. Throughout the service this morning, if you're here with us in the building, I, I invite you to come forward and light a candle um, in recognition of anything that you may be carrying in your heart, whether that's a joy or a sorrow. It's such a joy to have guests. I don't see any guests in the building, and I didn't see any unfamiliar guests on Zoom. But we do have some f regular, quasi-regular faces, so welcome to everyone. I'm going to give us a chance to say hello and greet each other in person while Carol plays a few tunes on the piano. So let's take a moment to greet everyone. Hello to everyone on Zoom. Welcome to the service. All right, welcome back. On the slide that Pam is gonna put up for us momentarily is gonna be some information about our upcoming services here at the UUFLB. Next week on February 25th, we're gonna have our Social Justice Sunday. As you know, the fourth Sunday is typically our Social Justice Sunday. And I believe it's Keisha Johnson. Keisha Johnson from Wheelchairs for All is gonna be with us. Uh, letting us know about the wonderful things that they're doing with their organization. The following week on 3-3, we have Reverend Terry LePage coming back. She's become a regular visitor with us, so Reverend Terry LePage will be with us in the first weekend in March. And then March 10th, we have Charles Langley from Public Watchdogs uh, coming in. And then in terms of announcements that I know that we have, we have an impromptu pizza luncheon that's going to happen after the service today. So thank you to everybody who helped put that together. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, also immediately following the service, we're going to be having a special congregational uh, meeting. The sole purpose to is to consider the adoption of the eight principles as a congregation. If you guys remember back in 19... 84, 83, the seven principles were adopted. We did a, a, a light search of the records and we couldn't find that we as a congregation actually adopted the seven principles, so we're gonna clear that up today, adopt those seven principles that have been hanging around and are on the wall, 
And also, in, in conjunction, we're going to propose and discuss adopting the eighth principle. So we'll adopt those eight principles. The other announcements, as usual, on the first Thursday of every month, we help with uh, the assisted living facility. And tomorrow on Mondays, which I haven't been able to make for several weeks in a row, is a marvelous gathering of the community and a chance to get together one-on-one -on -one with Zoom at Noon, hosted by our very own Paul and his marvelous co-host and star, Candy. So if you haven't had a chance to get in on Mondays at Zoom at Noon, uh, my girlfriend Lindsay, Lindsay calls it the ladies that lunch, and I go to the ladies that lunch on Mondays. <laughs> but uh, join us for that. Are there any other announcements from the body before we move on from announcements? Seeing none, we will keep it moving. Our centering thought, our centering thought today is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I want to take a special moment and say thank you to Jean Paris. Uh, I don't know exactly the date, and I didn't make a note. But in the not so distant past, in our UU World magazine, there was a full article uh, expose written about Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Gene clipped that article and sent that to me, so I appreciate it. it was helped, it's helped inform me on several different things, which is why I think she sent it to me. But here's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I, Emerson, and I invite you to read it with me aloud. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles which I thought was fitting because at some point today we're going to talk about some principles at several different points actually. Um, okay, our opening hymn. If you are able, I invite you to stand uh, and join Carol Cole, our lovely music director, in singing hymn number 1051, We Are. So please stand, number 1051, We Are. <laughs> For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings. We Spirit of God, we are mothers of courage and fathers of time. We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy, brothers of love. We are lovers of life, builders of nations. We're seekers of truth, keepers of faith. We are makers of peace. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Please remain standing for our unison affirmation. I invite you to read these words if and when uh, they feel right for you. Love is the spirit of this fellowship, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. You may be seated. We've come to the time in our service to briefly share about the important events that have touched our lives in the past week. 
The joys which we share are amplified. The sorrows are lessened. During this time of sharing our joys and concerns, we're going to pause the recording, and we're going to go to the participants on Zoom and see if there's anything. All right. It is much a blessing to be able to give as it is received. In this self-governing and self-sustaining community, we recognize that it is our responsibility to do both well. Our fellowship depends on the love and generous contributions from our members. We are empowered by the innumerable gifts of those who join in covenant with us, time, compassion, humor, and financial contribution, and all of our gifts, generously given, are needed for the fellowship to do its continued good work in the, wor good work in the world. During this time of offering, we will be passing a basket within the fellowship. The information on the screen gives additional ways to give, both electronically and through the mail. So please give generously, and Paul will be passing the basket. Now please join us in singing and making a circle, if possible, our words of sincere gratitude. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this Before you all get completely settled in, and before Don carries on, I, it's February, and I know there are February birthdays, and I know one of in particular is Don. So, is there anyone else that has a February birthday? It's Don's it. So let's I'll sing happy. <laughs> Shall we sing happy birthday to him? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Don. Happy birthday to you. Thank you guys very much. Um, there's several people that don't believe it, but I turned 50 on Friday. Um, so, yes. Thank you, thank you. We're going to move into a time of meditation and reflection. So now I'm going to invite you to find a comfortable place. I invite you, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes, place your feet on the floor, find a comfortable position for your hands, perhaps in your lap. Begin to relax the muscles in your face. And I'd like us for us together to breathe in and out, in and out. Our breath is a source, in and out. It's our source of connection to the air, in and out. It's in our breath that we're able to make sound in and out. 
And as we breathe together, we become closer and more united as a community. And as we continue to breathe together silently, I want you to reach into that silence and just see if you can find your own heartbeat in the silence. Continue to breathe silently. Let's breathe together and let's listen for our heart. Today's title is Waiting for Superman. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a confession. It was a little bit of a challenge after doing the series on the principles of coming up what I was going to talk about. Because for months and months, it was just look at the list. And it was the sixth principle. It was the seventh principle. So Pam asked me, she said, what is your sermon going to be about? And I thought about a figure that we're going to get to in a few minutes, and I said, let's talk about waiting for Superman. So, to get to where I wanted to go with the idea of Superman, I'm going to ask you to come back with me to the summer of 1983. So, in the summer of 1983, I was nine years old. And at this time, my family in 1981, I believe, had moved to Huntsville, Alabama. And when I was at home in Alabama with my parents, um, one of the things that we did not do very much was go to the movies. During the summers, I would go back up to Philadelphia, and when in Philadelphia, in the summer of 82, I got to go see E.T., the extraterrestrial, and I got to see Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan in 1982. And then in the summer of 1983, uh, my family friend, his name was Gary Carr, he was a gentleman in his 20s, and he took me to see the movie Superman 3. And Superman 3, uh, starred Christopher Reeve as Superman. It also included uh, Richard Pryor as one of uh, the bad guys in that particular movie. And this, Harry asked me this before uh, we started the service. This was really my introduction to Superman. I didn't meet Superman through the comic books. I met Superman through the Christopher Reeve movies. And that's how I met Superman. And in this particular movie, Superman has all kinds of conflicts. I mentioned that Richard Pryor is in there, and there's a bad guy that entices Richard Pryor onto his team because he's Richard Pryor plays a text genius. Superman extinguishes a fire in a chemical plant. He saves Columbia's coffee crops from a horrible storm that's being wreaked because of a, a weather satellite. And as the conflicts continue to escalate, Superman faces his this unprecedented challenge where he's split into two selves, and there's a bad Superman and a good Superman, and Superman has to fight himself. And this epic battle unfolds in a junkyard with the evil Superman repeatedly getting the upper hand on the good Superman, who was actually looking a lot like Clark Kent at the time. And in this struggle between light and darkness, Superman grapples not only with external threats, but also with his own inner demons. And the question becomes, can he overcome the malevolent forces that are himself? He does. He saves the day, because Superman always saves the day. 
And that's what I loved about Superman as a kid. It was a great movie. Um, and it, it gave me great content and it made me a wonderful storyteller back in Alabama on the playgrounds because lots of people hadn't seen Superman. So Superman was very valuable. And the nine-year-old in me grabbed on tightly to the idea that Superman could come and save the day. And it became a very large thread in my fantasy land and, and my intellectual fabric that there was a Superman and he could save the day. Now nine years later, we get to 1992, and I'm shipped off from high school to boot camp in the United States Navy, and I'm down in San Diego, California, and I don't know if I had figured it out quite yet by then, but that's when I really began to realize there was no Superman coming and I was going to be on my own. And I had to figure out that boot camp journey and everything that's come since on my own. And to be honest, uh, I was uncertain about the challenge that lied ahead in boot camp. I wasn't sure if anybody had ever successfully made it through boot camp because it was kind of hard compared to the life that I had as a kid. And I, I didn't have anything to look forward to. But then I started to think about Superman was a metaphor. And in that metaphor, it kind of represents us as, as humans. We often have a longing for external solution and for someone to fix our problem. And I'm going to ask Pam to bring up uh, the slide of our fourth principle, because it started to make me think about our fourth principle. And our fourth principle in Unitarian Universalism is that we affirm and promote a free and responsible, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And so now we have to fast forward another 20 years, and I have a nephew, and his name is Max. And Max sends me a message and it, it introduces me to a video about a gentleman just talking, he was out on a run and he was talking about a book that he had just written and his name was David Goggins and this is how I came to the idea for the sermon because will you put up the uh, post from Facebook? On Facebook there's a post going around right now, if you guys didn't know this is the post it's February and it's Black History Month, and some people are putting up a post that says, uh, retired Chief Petty Officer David Goggins is the only person ever to complete U.S. Army Ranger Training School, U.S. Air Force Tactical Control Party Training, and U.S. Navy SEAL Training. Um, each of these individual programs are nearly impossible com to complete. He not only completed each of the trainings, but served honorably, completing numerous contract combat missions in each capacity. And it goes on to say that David Goggins is an American hero and should be celebrated as a part of Black History Month. So I had seen this post, and Pam asked me what I was going to speak to you about today. And I said, I'm going to speak about Superman. So going back to when I was a kid, Superman is this fictitious figure who doesn't exist. And then my nephew, Max, introduces me to David Goggins, and just to get a reading of the room, does anybody know who David Goggins is right now? Nobody. Okay, so one, I have to make sure I don't channel too much of my inner David Goggins, because his mouth is really dirty and salty. He uses a lot of what they call four-letter words. So we're going to try to keep, it might have to do with that he was in the Navy, and I was in the Navy, and they start to sound like really resonant and familiar to when I was in boot camp. So David Goggins is typically regarded as the hardest, baddest ass man on earth. There's no one that is willing to put up a challenge because any challenger that comes forward, he shall take down. And so let's get the next picture. I want to tell you about what his first book is about. He has two books out there. In the first book, I was introduced to him. He talks about his life. This is David Goggins now, and this is David Goggins before he entered the United States Navy. And as you can see, there's an extreme transformation, and one of the things that people really love about David Goggins is he never stopped being a Navy SEAL. And what I mean by that is he never stopped running 25 miles a day with a pack on his back and doing 400 push-ups. He said he thought that was a way of life, and he looks at lots of other Navy SEALs who quote-unquote retire 
as being soft. And that gets back to the hardest man in the world. And so my nephew introduces me to David Goggins. And for me, what David Goggins did was see potential possibility in the human condition. He does truly superhuman feats. And I'm going to tell you some of this from memory. So if it's not exactly factually correct, just know that it was written down factually correct on this notebook and that I can tell it all to you. The first time he went and ran a marathon, he just decided that he was going to run a marathon. And he didn't train. I know lots of people who run marathons. They have books and charts, and they, they do training for weeks and months before. And he decided he was going to go out and run a marathon. And this guy stopped at the CVS. He bought like some Ritz crackers, a couple of Red Bulls and a Powerade, and went and ran a 26-mile marathon. And that was the beginning of his journey. He's run 100-mile races. He's run 200-mile races. He's run 300-mile races. He was formerly in the Guinness World Book of Records for doing over 4,000 push-ups, I mean pull-ups, over 4,000 pull-ups in a 17-hour period. He did it in 17 hours, 4,040 pull-ups, I believe he did. And so extreme, extreme physical accomplishments that before I read the book, I really didn't, I had heard of an ultra marathon. I know a marathon is 26.2 miles. I didn't know that there were people out there that were going and running 300 miles at one time in one sitting for any purpose, period. But it's about possibilities, the search for truth and meaning. And with David Goggins' challenges and putting the pictures out about how he used to look and how he looks now is that there is limitless possibility within us. When he runs the 100-mile race, he tells this elaborate story about he, he I technically broke both of his legs and finished the race on broken legs. And, and people get really angry at him because he does these extreme things. He, he, he put a picture on Instagram where his, toe had, his toenail had fallen off. That happens to a lot of marathoners. That's why I don't run that far. But people were really upset. And he said, do you think being hard and being great looks like peaches and whipped cream all the time? And then he reposted the picture and said, this is what it looks like. So now, in the idea of the fictitious comic book Superman and this character I've introduced you to named David Goggins, who shows us the power and potential of the human capacity, in our search for truth and meaning as individuals, we have to be able to push and challenge ourselves. And this community right now is in its own collective search for truth and meaning as to who we are and what we do and where we're going from here. And so David Goggins is an invitation to one, internally tap into our truly superhuman capacities. And I invite you, if you can handle the language, to listen to some of the speeches that he gives. He's on Instagram, he's on YouTube, he's all over social media. May we leave here today not wanting for a cape crusader, but ready to adjust, recalibrate, and stay after it to become better somehow. Our sermon title could have been Embracing Our Inner Goggins Beyond Waiting for Superman as we seek to find truth and meaning in both, indiv in, in both our individual lives and this lovely spiritual community. We can be inspired by the film characters from Superman, but I see the badassness from David Goggins and, the, and, and we need to run 100 miles. And when we need to do 10 pull-ups, I don't want us to look out to the fictitious Superman. We're challenged to continue to define ourselves as a faith community here at the UFLB. And the question is, who are we? And are we waiting for Superman? And now we're going to do our closing hymn, number 1007. There is a river flowing in my soul. So please stand if you're comfortable in mind, body, and spirit 
and join Carol in singing number 1007, There is a River Flowing in My Soul. There's a river flowing in my soul. There's a river flowing in my soul. And it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my soul. There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river flowing in my heart. And it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river flowing in my mind. There's a river flowing in my mind. And it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my mind. There's a There's a river flowing in my soul. Now we've come to the time to extinguish the chalice here at the UFLB and in our homes. I mean, this. And our chalice extinguishing words come in the form of a reading the path unfolds. May the winds of inspiration guide your steps as you walk the path of your own becoming. May your hearts be a compass ever pointed towards truth and your spirit a lantern illuminating the shadows. Go forth, my fellow seekers, into the bustling world, a world that hungers for kindness, wisdom, and grace. Remember that you are not mere spectators. You are co-creators of the story unfolding. May you find courage and vulnerability and resilience in the face of adversity. Embrace the messy beauty of your humility, for it is in the cracks that the light seeps through. And when doubt knocks at your door, invite it in for tea. Listen to its whispers, but do not let it overstay its welcome. You are made of stardust and ancient dreams. As you step into the unknown, know that you carry the echo of Emerson's words. The value of a principle is the number of things it will explain. May your principles be lanterns guiding you home. And now, my friends, go forth with open hearts, for life awaits with its mysteries and melodies. May your days be golden, your night star kissed, and your souls forever anchored in wander. Ashe, namaste, and blessed be. Let's join hands and sing our closing song, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Have a lovely day.